This is the paradox of water and diamonds, why rare things are valuable. I'm going to pretend to be moderator for now, uh, hoping that uh, Lee Modisett shows up because he is a, a fabulous economist and has tremendous insight on the matter. But I think we'll do okay. So, kind of starting out the question, what is the paradox of diamonds and water? Anyone? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. When you look at uh, diamonds versus water, one of them is ridiculously common, and the other one is ridiculously common. But one of them is needed to survive, and is needed by every single, well, almost every single living being on the planet. Yet it's the one that's cheapest. The one that's not uh, required ends up being the most expensive. So we're, we're going to explore why it's more expensive, and why water is the cheaper one, and you know, not just water and diamonds, but those are the two, uh, the two extreme examples, I suppose you could say. And uh, yeah, so my name's Art Shale. Um, I've been at LTE a couple times, um, former Marine, and uh, I currently work as a software developer. Um, and then you guys haven't introduced yourselves. Go ahead, Annalise. Hi, I'm Annalise. I'm an anthropologist and archaeologist, so I've done a lot of work with writing ethnographies and helping out with excavations. My most recent one was down in St. George this past summer, actually, where we were uncovering some ancient, um, we think, possibly Fremont people, um, it houses. So that was really cool. And I also like to backpack in my free time. So, yeah, kind of a, a world traveler of sorts. So that's that's why I'm on here. Okay, and my name is Scott Parkin. Um, I write under the name Scott R. Parkin. Got uh, 50 plus short stories uh, published, uh, former Writers of the Future winner. Um, not educated in either uh, diamonds or water, but uh, worked in the uh, uh, technology industry for about 35 years. Uh, now I'm trying to just write novels and see if I can make this thing fly. So, why are diamonds so much more valuable in current society than water, which is necessary for life? I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, and also, I think it depends on the context, right? Because there was um, a place in Egypt that had a lot of gold, and then there's another city that had a lot of salt. I can't remember the names off the top of my head, but gold was common in one city, and salt was common in the other. So they exchanged because you need salt to survive. And the other um, city needed gold to have money and to have a means of exchange. And so I think, number one, looking at the context of where you're at will also determine what's considered rare and what's considered common. Um, part two on that, they have to look at what is the meaning that we're ascribing to this thing. Um, and in this case, diamonds, it's not maybe it's not so much the diamonds that people want, but is it the prestige? Is it the social connection? Is it the um, economic freedom right it's you have to look at not just the item but this meaning we ascribe to it which is such a unique human characteristic where we can make a collective belief and it the power is literally this intangible force of belief that's continuing this power and so i just those are my two cents on that well and from a storytelling standpoint right that's the key is every society wants the basic necessities of uh, survival are established and uh, relatively insured will then move into social stratification uh, into you know a little bit of separation and now those commodities which are rare and separate the wealthy from the not wealthy or separate the powerful from the not powerful become far more important in terms of establishing that social hierarchy and this is something that you can use in fiction, especially um, as you tell stories, because this is the way the world works, right? And uh, so go ahead and recognize it. And to, to Annalise's point, that's part of the, the focus is that, uh, you know, if you're writing a story on a, uh, on a planet, what's rare and necessary on that planet, what's rare and unnecessary, but very hard to get. Therefore, you have to pay someone else to do it. Therefore, you have to have money and power. 
put those things in and that adds realism and depth to your story. Well, not only that, but I think, you know, you just brought up an idea for me. Um, thinking about this, you, you know, one of them could be a sign of prestige and a sign of power. Now, one of the thoughts that I've had, and, and I've seen this in some stories as well, but water is something that is usually so common that everyone's got it and it's not really a bargaining tool. Well, I'll give you water if you do this. Well, what do I need that for? I've got a well in my backyard for all the water I need. <clears throat> this isn't a, a much of a bargaining power unless you either one, uh, actually, no, not. There's only one situation when that can happen is when you can keep another party from having their water, either through natural means. I'm sure plenty of people, if not everyone here, has seen the movie Dune or read the book. Water is, is one of those commodities that's, uh, that's rare. Whoever can control the power can control the population. You know, of course, whoever controls the spice, but that's a, you know, that's another uh, uh, point entirely. So if you can get all that power, then you can also control the water. Um, and it's it's un unattainable unless you have that power to begin with, with as far as the the natural commodities. So that's another point to look at is how much you have, uh, how much power you already have in order to control those resources to control or to give yourself that leverage. Right. And that's part of the thing. So just kind of going down into the economics of it a little bit to the point that, uh, that uh, Art was making. When a thing is common, it has value. It must be regulated and someone will own the ability to either obtain or distribute that uh, generally. Um, but at some point it's sufficiently easy for people to get and sufficiently available that it has what we refer to as marginal utility, which is to say that it's useful, it's necessary, but the cost to, uh, to acquisition uh, ratio is so small that it becomes a marginal expense for most people. Um, and again, this is part of, part of the economics of it and understanding how those things work. You hear about how something has marginal utility. That can be both a pragmatic sense in, in the sense that, you know, the ability to uh, sing and dance may not be a survival trait until you're in a situation where that gets you cash which gets you the ability to then obtain food, lodging, and, and the other necessities. So, you know, again, playing with that and, and understanding how, how economies uh, are founded and how different elements in that economy can have different marginal values, uh, depending on location, depending on culture, uh, depending on religious or social um, structures, et cetera, et cetera. So again, right, just part of the fun. And to your point, Art, you were talking a little bit about, about uh, the relative scarcity of water in Dune, which is a very powerful part up front. And it leads to, for example, right, when one of the Fremen pulls his uh, veil aside and spits on the table at one, you know, if you did that to me, I'd, you know, ball up the fist and get ready to take you out. And that's what the character in the story first was inclined to do until he realized, no, wait, that person just gave me the single rarest, ele well, the second rarest element on this planet as a gift, as a, as a representation of equality, social equality and, and cooperation, not as spitting in my face. So, so that's again. a that's a great uh, a great story, and it actually leads over to one of the other uh, um, one of the other ideas that I've had in my mind regarding this panel. Um, one of the longest, well, not longest, but a very long uh, series of books that tons of people have read, The Wheel of Time. When you've got the uh, the desert uh, uh, people, you know, Avienda and all the other, you know, all the uh, all of them, their biggest compliment is share my water and share my shade, and because that's um you know of how valuable it is to them meanwhile on the other side of the planet you know or the other side of the continent where they don't have the scarcity they bathe in rivers because it's so abundant and they are absolutely shocked that they would just waste such a valuable resource 
You know, we see it with food all the time, for example, right? I happen to live in Utah in the middle of the Intermountain West. We don't get a lot of uh, fresh seafood here. <laughs> um, what we do get tends to be, you know, local freshwater uh, river trout, that sort of thing. But to get shellfish or to get, uh, you know, even salmon or tuna, right, standard uh, ocean fish is hard to get fresh because it's usually frozen, flown in, and then thawed. And I'm sorry, it's just not as good. When I lived in San Francisco, you know, you could get the freshest fish in the world. My son lived in Japan for a while. Uh, the idea of sushi over there, you know what? It's so common. Everyone loves it. You can buy it for, for a buck and a half on a conveyor belt because it's available and common in the culture. Um, so, you know, that, that has nothing to do with, with technology. It has to do with simple resource availability. I think another point to, that we can tie in with the marginal utility and resources is um, IP, the intellectual property. That's just as much of a resource. It might not be as like visibly tangible, but it definitely helps societies and cultures kind of function and acts as a center or even like a traumatic event. Like, I mean, Chernobyl, we could see how people actually commodified that by having these radioactive tours, right? Um, and so I think it's interesting to not just look at the actual resources people have, but what are these intangible ideas that's getting passed around, which is so much more prevalent now, just with accessibility to the internet, right? Social media, um, things that people, they had, there was cultural diffusion happening just because proximity and ideas get spread along, but I, I feel like it's happening at such a rate now that are we even keeping up with it? Um, so that's just something I wanted to add to, like to not just consider these actual resources, but the intangibles, that IP. You know, one of the interesting things is, you know, let's go ahead and talk about the elephant in the room. We're here on remote video because there happens to be a ambient condition that makes direct meeting maybe less feasible. Uh, so now social contact has become an incredibly rare and very valuable commodity that people will spend and risk various things to, um, to acquire, right? And that's just base, baseline behavior. It's got nothing to do. Uh, social contact is theoretically an infinite resource, and yet it brings with it now a risk. Uh, so, you know, just a, another fun idea there about marginal utility, about ideas or behavior being a conserved uh, uh, item as well. So what are some other some other ideas that, that you guys have, have thought of or can think of right now that are going to be ones that could command a higher price that we're not thinking of right now? You know, in the name, it's diamonds. Another one would be gold or, you know, gemstones like rubies. Um, what other ones are, are some that you guys can think of? Truffles. Like the black truffles oh. that's used in cuisine. Yes. And, you know, they have to get specialized pigs to find them. And the fact that people go to the lakes to get that, it's wild. I love the taste of truffle, I'll be honest. <laughs> like I, I think it's great. But the fact that it became this big thing, you know, and the time and energy it takes just to train the animals to find it. And you're not even guaranteed you'll find it. Um, so I always thought that was such an interesting focus of of um, a commodity to want and to desire um, truffles. What else? I mean, there's so many, but I'll, I'll think of them and tell you guys when it comes to my head. Just jumping into that a little bit, and there's a couple of concepts at work here, right? One is, to the point that Annalise made, it's hard to obtain a truffle. It's not that they're uncommon, because they are relatively common in certain regions. But to find them, separate them from the poisonous variety, get the ones that are worth having does require specialized knowledge, specialized tools, and then access to the markets. So there's a, again, this is all complexity that you can add to your world building. From a social behavioral standpoint, right? I believe that fungus is an alien creature from the planet Fizbane <laughs> attempting to take over our minds. 
I don't mind the flavor, but the texture drives me buggy. <laughs> and yet, if you put a truffle in front of me, I will eat it because it is a thing that I know to be rare and I will not, despite my other ambivalence, not take advantage of the opportunity that's been presented to me to obtain a thing that is rare, even though I don't like mushrooms. So it, it, again, it's just funny how that works. Um, not to, uh, go ahead. Arn. I was just gonna say, this is interesting. All of us seem to kind of be circling back towards food time and again. And it's it's really interesting to me that, you know, I don't assume that other races are gonna have the same, uh, the same tendencies. They're gonna have the same um, reason to circle back to their necessities which necessities turn from, you know, scavenging for food and uh, let's just say rats, like in, um, uh, what's the, uh, the, Scienti the Scientologist guy, what's, what's his name? Hubbard. Oh, Hubbard. He, yeah, he wrote the book Battle, uh, Battleground Earth. And he had um, uh, Johnny Goodboy, I think his name was, had him captive for so long and wasn't feeding him. When he let him out, he ate the first thing he could get to, which was a rat. And so now these aliens think that humans love rats. Well, if you do good, I'll send you out to get a, another good tasty rat. And so you, you end up at the low end where you're just scavenging to survive on water and rats versus the, the higher you get in life to the point where you're eating truffles and you're eating, and you're eating caviar. And some people would still struggle to – they wouldn't give you know, two hoots for, a, uh, for caviar for truffles. But you give them water, and suddenly it's magical. And so, but yeah, we keep circling back around to food and water, and this is a really good point that you could that you could use for any race that you would come across um, in science fiction. You know, and cutting back to Frank Herbert, who earlier in his career, well, actually, I think it was a little bit later in his career, wrote a book called The White Plague, where. Um, Basically, a plague went around the earth and made everybody sterile. Um, so all of a sudden, the idea of a fertile female became the central and necessary commodity. And the story is about this young woman who is actually locked in a, in a sealed chamber. Not entirely uh, with her permission, because she has suddenly become despite all other things, incredibly valuable to nearly everyone around her as a matter of simple survival of the race. So, you know, there's so many different ways that this plays and you can bring it in. I wrote a story based similar to that idea that, uh, based on the idea of a, of a genetic uh, uh, virus that made most women infertile and told it from the point of view of a quote unquote, ugly woman who suddenly, despite having been told her entire life that she is undesirable, unfit and unworthy, suddenly discovers that she is now the epitome of beauty on planet earth. And she is so ticked off at the arbitrary nature <laughs> of human beings that she becomes a, pardon me, a stripper to show them what they cannot have, to work out some of that lifelong anger that, that an unfair society, frankly, piled on her. So there's so many ways you can use this idea of, of rarity uh, and so many different aspects that you can bring into it. Uh, they just did a movie, well, not just, you know, I find that the older I get, the quicker time goes. So. A long time ago, many moons ago, they did a movie, Children of Men, and that was the same concept. Every single woman on the planet was infertile. They had no idea why. And then suddenly there's one young woman who's, you know, barely out of puberty, and she finds herself pregnant, and everyone treats her. And it's not a money thing. They're worth, or she's worth their reverence. And, you know, she's almost held up like, uh, like the Virgin Mary is to... Um, uh, to to the people almost they hold they hold her up, and it's funny she actually plays a joke or you know she tells a joke along that and she goes who's the father she goes what do you mean who's the father I've never had sex she was just kidding I don't know who it was what was I going to do get pregnant, <laughs> and so she even treats it like you know like the, you know 
uh, sexual attraction like it's almost nothing because the purpose of it, you know, originally was reproduction. Well, when you don't have to worry about that, it's not even worth that anymore to them. And so it's just worth jokes at that point in life. And suddenly, you know, obviously to her, it's so much more. And that was a movie that ended way too early. Well, you know, and there's a really interesting opportunity for characterization there, right? Because she has the rare thing. She is mm -hmm. the rare thing. Her viewpoint on the matter is going to be absolutely different and unique from everyone around her. And that exploration makes for a fascinating story. Um, you know, uh, looking, uh, this is more anthropology, but looking at things like, uh, uh, you know, ancient Egyptians and the idea of the sun god, who is important not only as the bringer of life, but also as the overheater of deserts, of the killer of people, um, the god of life and death in one. And so keeping that deity in check with offerings, with gifts, with reverence, creates an entire religious subculture that we can kind of look at today and say, oh, wasn't that cute? No, it was not cute. It was a matter of simple survival that we not get stuck in seven years of drought while living in the desert. You know, and, and it does. It creates, it creates social um, uh, behaviors, but it also creates social institutions. Um, and, and that's part of, again, part of the fun, part of the exploration, part of what makes a flat world come alive when you take advantage of that and you bring, bring in that idea of rarity, of marginal utility, of danger and the value associated with that into your narrative. Oh, for sure. And I like what um, both Scott and Art mentioned with the plots based around people that suddenly became commodities, rare ones. And that, that harking back to um, The Handmaid's Tale, I, I just kept thinking about that because that's a very similar vein with what was going on, right? It was like all of a sudden children were the commodity people wanted, but how do you get those children? It's through women who can have those. And also, I was, this is just a personal anecdote. I remember I was with a friend and he saw this guy around us and he was like, wow, that guy can get anyone he wants because he's foreign, <laughs> which he, he was from Eastern Europe. Um, and then I made a point and said, well, maybe it's because he's like six, eight and just sticks out. And that's a nat that's just something that's not common. And so people are going to be drawn to that. And I think it's interesting. You can bring in the ideas of like, what's the typical idea of marginal utility, but what are the subcultures? What are the ones that aren't um, part of that marginal utility, but then when the time comes, they get called upon. I was thinking about, have you guys seen the show, The Last Kingdom? It's about um, Uhtred and it was like, anyways, the idea is um, it's back when England, before it was England, and it was them fighting against the Vikings and trying to establish the kingdom of England as we know it. Um, but I remember one of the kings, and it's kind of similar to what um, happened in Game of Thrones where someone wanted help with their having a child and then they went to consulted a pagan like priestess to or like witch quote unquote to help them and it was interesting to see how like the the pagan like priest or witch wasn't the common um wanted necessity but all of a sudden there was a circumstance where when people get desperate you don't know what they'll turn to or who they'll consult when the time comes and then that can cause a shift in what's considered important or rare. You know, and one of the things that happens, sorry, I don't mean to talk so much, but I'm kind of a chatty guy. Um, but one of the things that happens is that those things can also be momentary and very personalized. So to use an example, I'm 70 pounds into a 130 pound diet. Uh, I've gone from a very unhealthy 330 pounds to a, marginally more healthy, 260. Um, but right now in this moment, my favorite food of all time, cheesecake, is <laughs> inaccessible to me. And so I dream of cheesecake. I crave cheesecake. And this is going to go away in six months because I will get cheesecake. 
So again, right, this is where we can start to have fun with the idea is, is, you know, it doesn't have to be global or, or culture wide. It can be very individualized. And this is the personal economy that drive the decision making of the characters in your story. So as you're creating again, right, complex worlds, keep all of these things in mind. And now is that, that interesting interplay of, of survival, power, uh, prestige, individual desire. If you're an ugly toad of a man, human companionship may be the most important thing you can find and you will destroy heaven and earth to get that. And their story lies. It's true. What is it? Um, Helen of Troy, the, the face that launched a thousand ships. Yeah. So kind of circling back to our, our core topic with the paradox situation, I, I was thinking of a specific type of paradox within a paradox itself. I know it's getting really meta. So are you guys familiar with the reason why uh, about pineapples in the, uh, in midi, not I'm going to say medieval times in, you know, three or 400 years ago, they were considered a status symbol in Europe because you couldn't get them. And if you could, it wasn't to eat, it was to display. And if you could display a pineapple, people knew that you were somebody. It had nothing to do with the nutritional value of this awesome Swiss fruit. Um, it was simply because it looked awesome, and if you had it, you had money. So this is one of the, uh, the reasons why, why we see things like diamonds and rubies and emeralds, you know, the crown jewels. What purpose do they serve? Nothing. They're a symbol. But they're valuable because it, you know, they, it took some skill to to dig them out of the ground. It took some skill to refine them, to um, to polish them, and get the correct facets on there, and find one that's, you know, that's not that's not uh, uh, flawed. And so they become valuable because of their status symbol. But yet another paradox on top of that, the second paradox I was talking about, it, you know, that serves no value, but it's really expensive. What happens when it does serve value? In the 1600s, rubies held no value except as a status symbol. They didn't do anything except they were a pretty red stone. What do rubies do today? They're extremely sensitive, and they're used in fine machinery to detect the exact edges of, of machined parts. And rubies are absolutely invaluable to them, but not because of any impractical reason, because they are the most valuable and are most suitable for the job. And along the same lines, what purpose did gold have in, in the same time, 1600s? It was nice and shiny and bright, and it was this, this fantastic gold color. But what is gold today? Well, among other things, right? It's an electrical uh, component. It is one of the best electrical conductors. conductors. You're exactly right. Yeah. It wasn't the original. The original was copper. Because why? Copper was copper. cheap. Gold, suppose, well, diamonds also are supposedly extremely common. But then we've got, you know, the De Beers company, and I'm not going to go into the politics behind it because I don't know the, fa the true facts of it. But supposedly they've driven up the price because they're pretty and people will pay it. And if they can throttle, you know, it going into market, they can control the price and keep it artificially inflated. Again, if that's true or not, I'm not really sure. But now we have a second, a second, um, uh, metric or uh, action against this commodity that's going to decide whether it's a, an expensive item or whether it's going to be as cheap as water. How, nece how necessary is it? With electronics, gold is absolutely necessary. Uh, necessary. Outside of that, it's a pretty yellow metal. And kind of following along that idea, any market that can be cornered in a complex society will be cornered and artificial rarity will be created. Again, we can argue about whether De Beers did that. I think historically we know they did. First, they controlled access to a relatively limited and difficult to find resource. Then they spent, you know, a hundred years advertising why ordinary people needed diamonds. Because diamonds are a girl's best friend. And if you don't Diamond. give your girl diamonds, you don't really love her. 
you are not a worthy man if you do not give her diamonds. So now they're playing on the emotions. Now they're playing on, and by artificially restricting the market, they give themselves a source of wealth. Uh, again, right? So we have social behavior. We have uh, uh, object uh, rarity. We have process controls. We have market controls. And all of that becomes just so much fun to play with. I'm going off of what Scott and Art were saying. Part of one of those ploys to create a market control, that artificial need, I think, a lot of companies play off of insecurities, right? Because like you were mentioning art, like what do you do if you're um, a toad of a man and you want companionship, right? And so what would what would a marketer do? They would be like, oh, how do we play off these insecurities to create this need or want in people, even if they don't actually need it, right? And for, I would say for females going off of looks, right? It's beauty. Why do you think the cosmetic industry is booming and they actually put gold in makeup now? I don't know if you guys know that, but yeah, they do nanoparticle gold. It supposedly helps your skin exchange ions and get oxygen better or something. Who knows if that's true or not, but people buy it and they're willing to pay $12 for one facial mask. That's just one. <laughs> so imagine buying a box of those. The perception of value often is so much more important than the actual fact of value. And getting back to the title of the panel, that is the paradox. That the way a thing is valued often has nothing whatsoever to do with how easy it is to obtain, how difficult it is to refine. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working on a story right now, a novel right now, actually, where power, which is generally considered right, uh, uh, electrical power or right, motive power, um, energy, is so common because they found a room temperature superconducting ceramic. Therefore, they can create incredibly efficient machines. A simple solar panel suddenly, instead of powering your watch, powers your village. Well, if you've got a surplus of energy, but a minimal quantity of organic material, your economy suddenly shifts radically. Things, even high technology, may be incredibly common because you have energy to burn. What you don't have is the ability to turn minerals into organic materials. So again, right, this becomes fun. In my case, I have this society using these super efficient machines that they're creating and saying, okay, well, gee, if I can suddenly solve the energy problem, could I create a machine three miles long, a mile and a half tall, that does nothing but extract oxides from minerals and terraform a planet? How valuable is that to other people? Can I use that leverage now to escape the governmental control of the Commonwealth of which I'm a member? Can I establish my own military strength using surplus energy as a weapon? And again, you start well, to Well, you're fun. describing the plot of Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, with the Genesis Project. They didn't want it to get the hands in the hands of the military to be used as a military weapon. And so it was a... Uh, a threat of force almost if it got into the wrong hands. And you, as you were saying that, I was thinking about one of it's, this is, this may come across as stupid, but I have kids. So I end up watching lots and lots of kids movies, a bug's life. Mm -hmm. They have an extremely valuable commodity in their food, but what do they exchange it for from the grasshoppers? Not getting squished. That is their, that is their, um, their, uh, currency. And so there gets to a point to the end of the movie, and, and I'm an adult. I don't care. I like kids' movies. And so anyway, the bugs are going, um, but, you, uh, but, you know, you can't squish all of us, you know. And, and then he sees the grasshopper's eyes flicker, and he says, and you know it. And suddenly, within a split second, the entire economic system that ants versus grasshoppers have is entirely flipped, and there is nothing valuable that the grasshoppers hold anymore nothing and there are so many ways to play off of that and it has been played off of in in books in movies and it's and you, if you think about it it's a common trope if you can get it back into the original context 
if you don't have that threat of violence and if it's worth nothing, you have no bargaining power. And that is your commodity that's no longer worth a hill of beans. That reminds me of, um, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with Spartan culture, but they had the helots, which were the slaves, and they would have regular, um, basically, cullings where they would get all the strongest slaves together and they made it seem like a prestigious thing, but they would actually do it to gather them so they could kill them off because they knew the slaves outnumbered the Spartans like 10 to 1. It was a pretty big um, population differential. And so, okay. And um, yeah, no, it's, so it's interesting to see what happens when that power shifts, but also really quick, um, maybe looking at societies where when they try to take away that marginal utility, I'm thinking of like the USSR, what happens when you try to take that away? How does that shift the culture? How does that shift per um, the perspectives and the wants of the people? Because I mean, I have a lot of opinions on that whole the USSR and how it was functioned, but I see it as a way they were almost trying to take away that idea of marginal utility because every everything's the same, everything's equal, right? Like a doctor's going to get paid the same as a grave digger. How's that going to change the the, um, the interplay between individuals? You know, going back to a, you know, kind of an absurd example, um, this symposium is called Life, the Universe, and Everything, based on the Douglas Adams uh, series of books. One of the jokes he makes in that series is that the social engineers saved everybody but the telephone sanitizers. And then it turns out that everyone on the starships, on the generation ships, died from viruses from unclean telephones. So, you know, again, it's so fun. Uh, and there's so many ways you can look at the value exchange um, that have nothing, seriously, nothing whatsoever to do with intrinsic value. So that's, that's where as an author or as a storyteller or as a visual storyteller, right? Get off the idea of, of common rarity because yes, that can be one way that we value a thing, but there are so many other ways. You know, one of the things I was uh, thinking about was uh, uh, beauty, right? We look at feminine beauty today, and that usually means tanned skin, thin, athletic. Back in the 1500s, that meant pudgy, pasty, in Europe at least, and, and why? Because being pudgy and pasty meant you had the wealth to stay indoors and access to fatty foods, which were not common. Therefore, rather than having the time to spend sculpting your body, which we value now, you had the money to spend through power or control to get fatty foods and to not go out in the sun because browned skin was evidence of hard work and you don't have to do that. Um, you know, and again, that becomes fun because, you know, it's all of those complex interplays. So just think about that no matter what structures you're working with, there are so many ways to create value and in, and to affect human behavior and non-human behavior, and to then play against the differences in, in how different organisms may interact and why their behavior seems irrational to us and vice versa. You're muted, Art. Sorry about that. I'm looking at one of the questions over in the attendees uh, uh, channel, and they're talking about the, the artificial rarity and the f artificial scarcity of things. And one of the things they bring up is our textbooks. And yeah, absolutely. Those are ridiculously expensive since I just graduated, you know, just barely two years ago. They are. I had, I had one uh, college professor when I went to Ohio State. She was one of the co-authors of the required uh, $300 textbook. Right. Um, when I got to Weber State, but that was, you know, that was 15 years ago. So when I got to Weber State and started going to school, um, they would, uh, uh, some of my professors would uh, require a textbook as well. 
but the textbook they required was literally free and open source. So physics was some of the most expensive textbooks you had. He would say, okay, it's available right here, and there's a PDF of it that you can legally download. And so if you want to fight against artificial, uh, artificial scarcity, then you have to compete with it. You can't just – it doesn't just happen. You have to put in the effort, and you have to replace what is artificially scarce. So in that case, an in, in open source um, market – you need information if you're going to combat information or if you're going to replace the information rather. They hold a, a monopoly on gathered information, which is what's on the pages of that book. If you can replace it, there's no longer an artificial scarcity. And they're hoping that you don't do that, that you can't do that. Well, and what's one of the great scourges of the modern market? Software piracy. All of a sudden, that scarce textbook that is available on downloadable and duplicatable PDF format mm -hmm. breaks the monopoly on, you know, uh, on the economic power, and thus you become a criminal who must be captured, incarcerated, separated, and have your influence minimized. Again, right? The economies, the markets, they play in sometimes complex ways markets must be protected and they will be through government mm -hmm. power and this actually goes on to a second topic that you brought up earlier um it's not just physical or the intangible i guess it would be intangible but you are not you are not always paying for um for how rare something is you are also paying for the skill behind it you don't pay a photographer for half an hour's worth of time for with fifteen dollars you pay them $300 because it took them 17 years to get to the point where they're at and they know what they're doing. You don't have to go with them. You can go with someone else entirely. So you're paying for the time someone has put into getting to that level of expertise. So it's not just the tangible. So um, did we have, uh, speaking of questions from the uh, audience, did we have more? So I think this is normally Lee's uh, spot where Lee would step in. Yes, we have one question from Madeline R uh, uh, RBD. She asks, um, let's say a story setting is in a water-deprived world. What are the ramifications of using something consumable like water as a currency? Um, I don't well, know if there would be any specific... Oh, go ahead. You do it. You go. Um, if, it's, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I just the movie Waterworld is not the whole premise where water is the scarcity. At least fresh water. They're surrounded by salt water. Right. Clearly. Um, and so you can kind of see how that plays out in that that movie in that context. But I mean, just think about what happens, I feel like when anything becomes rare. It's like toilet paper. Who would have thought toilet paper would be something we will be fist fighting over in Costco and yet here we are. So again, I think it goes back to um looking at people's fears, motivations, why they want something. Um, not just fears, motivations, but you know, like what what is it providing them? Is it providing them safety? Is it providing them prestige? Is it, you know? So those are questions I think to consider when there is a resource in a world that is rare. So it's, that's an interesting point in itself too. You know, how rare is it? You would think that in places like just in the United States, in the old West, you know, a lot of the Westerns always took place in a, uh, a desert town, you know, where where wood was, you know, starting to fall off from above the uh, doorways, where everything was just run down and beat up. But water was never a concern because with us, we're looking at um, individual people and we have built into our DNA a desire to be at least a little bit decent. And part of that is I have water. It's not going anywhere for me. I can charge you whatever I want to for it, but go ahead and drink some. You know, this is a common well. I could control it, but I'm not a jerk, so have some water. And so there comes, there's even a point that the individual um, people in question can or can choose not to control it based on, you know, their upbringing or based on their background. So it could be a, a societal teaching. And as well, right, uh, looking at uh, uh, Star Wars Episode Four water can be obtained through technology. So you're going to suddenly discover that there will be new technologies developed that are 
somewhat exotic to our minds to obtain water more readily. So you're going to have a social component. Uh, you're going to have right the, almost the worship of, of drinkable water. You're going to have markets that are going to try to control or limit its distribution if you can't control the source of it and control the distribution of it. Either but that's way, only if he can get uh, Tashi Station to get a power converter. Right. Got to get that power converter. You <laughs> can't do anything. Um, you know, I'll just take it from the solar two unit. Um, you know, and that's part of the thing is there's so many ways. And it's not just that it's rare, therefore people fight over puddles in the, in the sand. It's about the, the social, the cultural, the religious, the individual behavior versus the group behavior, how that uh, scarcity interacts with other uh, issues, and how all of that creates a level of complexity. Frankly, we all know about being thirsty. But what more can you do? How, where can you go that's deeper and more interesting and unique? And that's where success lies, is when you can find that unusual thing, create a market for it, and you become the best provider of that service. And as writers, that's theoretically what we do for a living. So uh, there was a question in the uh, chat. It was from Nick Stasnopoulos. I apologize if I butchered that name because I'm terrible at it. Um, they were talking about toilet paper and it being a uh, supply issue and not a production issue or supply system issue. Does that actually change anything? Does it matter to the person that needs a commodity what the reason for the scarcity is? It, okay, so interesting bit of trivia. The, the thing about toilet paper was, yeah, uh, we're, we are out of time. So let me just offer one quick thought. Um, the toilet paper issue was interesting because it was the form factor. Consumers were accustomed to soft, comfortable toilet paper. <laughs> Industrial application for office buildings had plenty of toilet paper, but all the offices were closed and their distribution network was set up to deliver scratchy toilet paper in gigantic rolls to industrial applications. So it was there and people would have paid to get it, but that's not how the distribution system worked. And so what was actually a common product could not be distributed to the people who needed it by contract, by, you know, uh, by uh, physical distribution problems. And thus we created a massive problem that had no reason to exist, no rational reason to exist. That's fun. And on that note, I think we're uh, done today. Thanks, guys. It's been great.